Live from the Christian Research Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina, you're listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff. We're on the air because life and truth matter. The mission of the Christian Research Institute is to equip believers to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. To join us on air with your question, dial 888-ASK-HANK, which translates to 888-275-4265. For more information, go online to equip.org. And now, here's Bible Answer Man host, Hank Hanegraaff. And thank you very much, Randy. It's always great to be in studio as we answer your questions as they come in from around the world. The number to dial is always to get your questions answered live on today's broadcast, 888 Hank numerically 888-275-4265. Before we get to calls and questions, uh, my colleague, Dr. Larry Johnston, got me all up in a tizzy today by giving me an article uh, by David Klinghoffer, uh, titled On Controversial Science, Skepticism is Now Social Deviance. Skeptics are weeds. And as I was reading through this article, I realized that there are a lot of words that have been added to the lexicon. And reading the article itself uh, brought me to some other articles that I want to talk about for just a moment. And the reason I want to talk about this is because we have the perfect antidote in Darwin's House of Cards, as well as Revolutionary. More on that in a moment. Uh, but social deviance from the consensus of scientific community has to be weeded out. We have to weed creationists out of schools, out of the scholastic uh, context completely, and creationism is now also being defined as intelligent design. So anyway, as a result of the article that Larry gave me, I started reading Nautilus and the article titled, How to Weed Creationism Out of Schools. Um, The article, pretty interesting. Biology teachers partly want to avoid the ire of Darwinophobic parents. There's a new word for the lexicon, Darwinophobic parents. I mean, you've heard Islamophobic. Uh, Now we have Darwinophobic parents. And uh, this is going to be really hard for the Darwinic, Darwinophobic parents to be able to do because creationist attempts to ban evolution in favor of a literal interpretation of Genesis have fallen on hard times. They have largely failed because of the Supreme Court's adoption of the so-called Lemon Test. Back in 1971, uh, we had this uh, Lemon Test. This made creationism virtually impossible to constitutionally protect. Its primary effect is to advance religion. That's why it's hard to protect, and it results in excessive government entanglements with religion. So, Uh, You can't protect uh, any of this anymore. Uh, The uh, Darwinophobic parents are simply out of luck. Uh, And and, and the article goes on to talk about how we have this creationist rebranding. It's called intelligent design. And according to the article in Nautilus, intelligent design holds that evolution was God-guided and was also advanced as a credible alternative to evolution to be discussed in class for the sake of academic freedom. Um, And uh, the article goes on to point out how uh, Darwin made uh, a major contribution that is not a theory, it's not a low-grade hypothesis, it is simply irrefutable fact. His major contribution was a suggestion that evolution can be explained by natural selection of random variations. So elegant is this theory that it can be uh, explained, as Ann Campbell says, in just five words. 
random genetic variation, comma, non-random selection. I'm not sure if that's four or five words. There's a hyphenated word in there. Anyway, all of that got me thinking about intelligent design. Because is it really true that intelligent design is a creationist rebranding? And is it really true that intelligent design holds that evolution was God-guided? Well, it turns out that this is a misconception. So here you have these people waxing eloquent about Darwinophobia, but they can't even get their facts straight when it comes to intelligent design. And Richard Dawkins, of course, I talked about him on yesterday's broadcast, is one of those that can't get his facts straight. He's a professor of the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford. He's a zoologist, and he is the best-known Darwinist on the planet. Uh, The Royal Society took his book, Selfish Gene, and they now say it is the most significant science book in the history of the human species. Well, uh, Richard Dawkins gets such uh, great plaudits because of his language. Uh, For example, uh, he claims that those who do not believe in evolution are ignorant, stupid, or insane. So in place of these emotional stereotypes, let's look at intelligent design, and their proponents who hold to reason and actually turn out to hold to empirical or testable science. So a couple of points I want to make in this regard. Number one, intelligent design proponents are willing to follow scientific evidence wherever it leads. In other words, intelligent design theorists neither presuppose nor preclude supernatural explanations for the phenomena they encounter in an information-rich universe. And therefore, the intelligent design movement rightly practices open-minded science, which is precisely the opposite of what we are finding in the evolutionary community. There we find invective. There we find this this mad dash to try to weed out people. So if you are someone that believes in intelligent design, you're like a weed. You've got to get rid of the weeds. Kind of what uh, Darwin was talking about in uh, Survival of the Fittest. Uh, This was a way of getting rid of the weeds, or what Dawkins was promoting in the selfish gene. You know, if you let the weeds infect, the more fit genes, well, evolution isn't going to be possible. But there's something else I want to say about the intelligent design movement. It begins with some common sense scientific principles, like intelligent design is detectable wherever there is specified, organized complexity. In other words, wherever there is information. And this design principle is central to science. And when you take that principle and you apply it to information-rich DNA, or you apply it to irreducibly complex biochemical systems, or the Cambrian explosion, or the fact that the Earth is perfectly situated in the Milky Way for both life and scientific discovery, or, well, you you can come up with more ores. When you apply it to information-rich DNA or all the other things that I just mentioned, what do you find out? You find out that an intelligent designer is the most plausible scientific explanation. So that's just simply following the truth wherever the truth leads you. 
There's a final point here, and that is that intelligent design lends no more support to Christian theism than Darwinian evolution lends to atheism. And therefore, the appropriateness of ID for public education ought to be judged on the basis of the theory's explanatory power, not on its metaphysical implications. And we have exactly the opposite going on in science today. I was thinking about this, uh, uh, this quote in uh, Bethel's book, Tom Bethel's book, Darwin's Heart, House of Cards. And it was the quote by, um, by Colin uh, Patterson, where, where, where when Bethel asked him why he had embraced the theory of evolution, was it because all the scientific facts pointed in that direction? Well, Colin Patterson said, absolutely not. The reason that I have accepted it is because of faith. In other words, he had bought into the metaphysical implications, Christina. Always by my side, just open the book to the exact quote. Did you do it to the exact quote? Where is that? It's on the bottom. It's on the bottom? Colin Patterson. I think, is that the one you're No, this to? isn't the one. But anyway, oh, the... the <laughs> anyway, the point is that, that this is precisely what a Colin uh, uh, Patterson said. You know, and Colin Patterson was the... Uh, I forget what his exact title was, but uh, he was the curator or he's the head of the, uh, the, the Museum of Natural... Uh, history in London. Um, yeah, and they have all kinds of fossil specimens there. And uh, again, he accepts Darwinian evolution not as fact, but he accepts it as a faith. In fact, at one point in his career, he went as far as to say that he knows one thing for certain about this. It is that it ought not to be taught in high school. Thank you, Christina. She finally gave me the right page. <laughs> I should have had this uh, figured out a long time ago. I, it's been a while since I read this quote, but but uh, here, let's get to his uh, credentials first of all. Um, okay. Still can't find it. At any rate, we'll get to his credentials in a moment, but uh, this is what he said. When Bethel asked him whether he believed in evolution, he replied, well, isn't it strange that this is what it comes to, that you have to ask me whether I believe it as if it mattered whether I believe it or not. Yes, I do believe it. But in saying that, it is obvious that it is a faith. Uh, the exact... Um, the exact uh, credentials of Patterson is that he is a senior paleontologist at the Natural History Museum in London. I, I guess I got it sort of right, curator, senior paleontologist. And he is a fellow at the Royal Society. But here, here's a guy with those credentials that are, he's saying it ought not to be taught in high school. And he's saying that he accepts it. So he's an evolutionist, he's a Darwinist, but he accepts it. Uh, only as a faith. Uh, again, why do I bring all of this up? I bring all of this up because I want to put Darwin's House of Cards into your hand. I want to give you some motivation to get this book. It is absolutely necessary to get this book uh, because your kids are going to school and your kids are, are going to be taught the evolutionary paradigm and ID is going to be dissed as mere fundamentalist creationism. And uh, they have to have some kind of ammunition. This book will give them all the ammunition they need and a whole lot more. Darwin's House of Cards, as well as a revolutionary Michael Behe. Uh, he's a reluctant revolutionary. He was an evolutionist. But then he began to look at the facts, and now he's a leader in the ID movement. Well, we have a, uh, a lot of people hanging on. We'll go to our phone calls in just a moment. I do want to take one call before we go to our phone call. Oh, well, I guess I can't go to any phone calls right now because we're coming up to station break. But when we come back from the station break, we'll go right to your calls. 
right here on the Bible Answer Man broadcast number to dial, triple eight ask Hank, numerically triple eight two seven five forty two sixty five. Remember Darwin's House of Cards, revolutionary. These are gifts by which we equip you to always be ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us with gentleness and with respect. Available for those who support the ministry. Check it out on the web at equip.org or simply write me at box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. And as always, our resource consultants are standing by, 888 and the letters CRI. We'll be right back with answers to your questions, 888-ASK-HANK. The Christian Research Institute exists to equip you with resources to stand against assaults on biblical truth. This month, we are tackling the threat of Darwinism. In Darwin's House of Cards, veteran journalist Tom Bethel explains that Darwin's theory is a 19th century idea past its prime, propped up by logical fallacies, bogus claims, and empirical evidence that is all but disintegrating under an onslaught of new scientific discoveries. Are you equipped to help dismantle the Darwinian myth that dominates our world today? To receive your copy of Darwin's House of Cards as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. We'll be back in just a moment with more from Hank Hanegraaff. God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs of the Bible's Divine Inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Equip. Org. In his book, Darwin's House of Cards, Tom Bethel writes, The science of Darwinism was poor all along and supported by very few facts. Although Darwinism has been promoted as science, says Bethel, its unstated role has been to prop up a philosophy of materialism and atheism along with it. As Christians, we are called by Christ to be wise and build our house on the rock. Darwinian devotees, however, have built their ivory tower on sinking sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. To receive your copy of Darwin's House of Cards as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. With over half a million copies in print, Hank Hanegraaff's Bible Answer Books were born out of his many years of hosting the Bible Answer Man broadcast. He's taken his on-air answers to questions and chiseled them until only the gems emerge. Questions involving biblical interpretation, cults, science, ethics, apparent contradictions, and much more. This remarkable collection of concise answers is now even better. My goal, says Hank, is to take the complex and make it simple and memorable. Receive your copy of the complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition revised and updated as our thank you for your gift by calling 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. That's equip.org.
In his book, Darwin's House of Cards, Tom Bethel writes, the science of Darwinism was poor all along and supported by very few facts. Although Darwinism has been promoted as science, its unstated role has been to prop up a philosophy, the philosophy of materialism and atheism along with it. As Christians, we must understand the facts and be able to dismantle Darwin's outdated ideas and their de-evolutionary influence on our world. To receive your copy of Darwin's House of Cards as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. And now, here's Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you, Randy. Again, the number to dial, 888-ASK-HANK. Let's go right to the phone lines. Brent in Wichita Falls, Texas. Hi, Brent. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Your question. Are you there? Yeah. My, my question My question was on First uh, John 3, 4, uh-huh. where it says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Uh, I, you know, we're taught that when the law has been uh, done away with or fulfilled, but then it shows you know, that, that sin is a transgression of the law. And then, you know, it also talks about in Matthew 5, 17, um, where it states that there, he says, it will not do away with one jot or tittle of it until all is fulfilled. And that fulfillment, he says that heaven and earth, until heaven and earth is done away with. So our, we still see the same earth. We still see the, see the heaven. It's not done away with yet. So we see that the law still stands, but then we thought that we don't have to obey the law anymore. I'm just... Curious how that's working out. Sure. And I think what's important here is to recognize that there are different aspects of the law that are referred to in Scripture. So you have to contextualize this by what is meant. And what is talked about here is a universal, uh, a universally binding moral law. Uh, so uh, again, the real answer to your question is what do you mean when you talk about law? I mean, law obviously is necessary to maintain order in society. Law is a guide for the believer in living out the Christian life. But the broad aspects of the law include civil aspects, which were largely a function of a theocratic kingdom, and therefore they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The same could be said with the ceremonial aspects of the law. But the moral aspects of the law are universally binding on humanity. And, and, and so the Ten Commandments, uh, thou shalt not murder, uh, haven't suddenly been abrogated, or thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not coven. They have not been abrogated. In fact, uh, if you want to boil all of this down and see the fact that Jesus Christ lent credence, in fact, underscored the necessity of the law, it's boiled down to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And on those two laws hang all the law right and the there. commandments. On that um and by the way, just to, just real quickly, with, with respect to what you said about Matthew, uh, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Uh, so, th- so, so Jesus did not abolish the universally binding moral law. Uh, that would, in fact, uh, uh, completely mess up the great grand meditative of Scripture, if that were the case. The, the only thing he paid for on the cross was he, he fulfilled the law of sin and death. Um, but the other laws, um, the moral laws, and where, where is it, you know, I don't see where it, it says in the Bible this is moral laws and this is, you know, a ceremonial laws. They're all his laws. He says, not one jot or tittle, not... Well, this is what you get when you learn how to read the Bible for all it's worth, though, and I think that's the critical point. Once you learn to read the Bible for all it's worth, you read through the Bible and you realize that all of the Bible is in the Old Testament pointing forward to something, and it does so through types and shadows. Uh, So you have God using earthly perceptible realities pointing to heavenly verities. Uh, Thus you have temple. Uh, the temple priest and sacrifice, 
all of that points forward to an ultimate sacrificial lamb. But it would be absurd to continue sacrifices when the ultimate sacrificial lamb has come. Not only so, but we're explicitly told that. So if you leave the magnifying glass in the hands of the biblical authors, like the author of Hebrews, uh, Paul, I think, wrote Hebrews, uh, he makes clear that to go back to the type and shadow when the satisfaction has come for the type and shadow is tantamount to trampling upon the sacred blood of Jesus Christ. Francine next in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Hi. Uh, yes, hi. I'm just glad to find out, um, is it biblical to go up into the courts of heaven? There seems to be some uh, people going up to the courts of heaven and to me, are they meeting with godly deity, or or what are they connecting with? To me, I just kind of talk to Jesus. Like, is this biblical, this kind of... Well, it, it, it really isn't, and it isn't even realistic. Because if you, you think about it, uh, a person's predilection before they have a near-death experience is what they come back and report happened during the near-death experience. So, for example, if you're a Muslim and you have a near-death experience, uh, you're going to come back with a different story than if you're a Buddhist and you have a near-death experience, or you're an atheist and you have a near-death experience, or you're a fundamentalist Christian and you have a near-death experience. Uh, and, And so whatever you believe before ends up being a contextualization for the near-death experience uh, that you come back and tell people about. And these have become uh, stories that have produced a whole cottage industry. Uh, Some of the bestsellers in the history of publishing have been bestsellers based on near-death experiences. Uh, The fact that all of these experiences are different Uh, leads us to a logical conclusion. They can all be wrong, but they can't all be right. Uh, So this is not a a substantive or a a good way in order to figure out what's going on uh, in the afterlife. If you want to know what's going on in the afterlife, then you have to read the Bible for all it's worth. You have to get the information from some objective uh, rather than a subjective frame of reference. Okay, because I know they're they're going to pray in in, in the court out, court of heaven and believing they're getting answers doing that. But to me, going to Jesus is the one I I think is the most important one than trying to go up into court heavens and not even know if you're connecting with godly or if even demons could be talking back to you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it's uh, it, it's critical that you contextualize uh, everything that happens to you, which is subjective, in uh, around something that's objective. And in a uh, Christian worldview, what's objective is the Word of God. But as I said, popular interest in near-death experiences is at a fever pitch. And this started uh, way back with Raymond Moody's Life After Life and continues on with Todd Burpo's Heaven is for Real and Eben Alexander's Proof of Heaven, Mary Neal's To Heaven and Back. Uh, These near-death experiences have titillated the masses for the better part of a generation. And uh, you you continue to have these new revelations as a result of, uh, of... of uh, these experiences, but the objective reference point is always sacred scripture, and unfortunately, as I said, it's been supplanted by the subjective experiences of those who have allegedly had a foretaste of heaven. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. I wrote about this in Afterlife, What You Need to Know About Heaven, the Hereafter, and Near-Death Experiences. There are uh, three or four, I think almost ten entries on near-death experiences a uh, subject that I've studied for quite some time. Let's go back to the phone lines, talk to Richard in Fayetteville, North Carolina, listening on Sirius XM 131. Hi, Richard. Hi, Hank. How are you? I'm doing great. Just uh, want to thank you for your ministry and praying for you to get well. Thank you. And uh, also uh, just had some questions that I've been listening to for many years, and I think uh, when I have discussions after uh, listening to you or just talking about some of the subjects that you were brought up on your show by your listeners, uh, there seems to be some misunderstandings, I think, 
uh, with the idea of thinking positively or or using uh, you know what God has given us in terms of our ability to to look at things through different lenses, if you will, um, in order to not only improve our you know improve our life, but also to just have a better attitude about everything around us. And I mean, I think that falls into you know an area where we can quickly get misled. Obviously, thinking of something like an Osteen or some of the prosperity preachers that are out there. Um, but I also know that you know different subjects like psychoneuroimmunology, where they talk about the actual release of chemicals um, in a human body when you smile or when you have happy events or when you're when you're playing with your kids or playing with your dogs, and how that can actually enhance somebody's health and help them get through you know tougher, challenging situations, health situations and improve their immune function. And so I I understand the, the need to use caution when describing some of these things as biblical versus non-biblical, but also uh, there also has to be, a, a, I think, a balancing act on how we approach using a positive attitude or a, you know, a, um, you know something that uh, means something to us that puts us in a good mood so we can constantly stay in a good mood versus letting, you know, the negatives around us get us down. Well, I think you make a good point, Richard. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely true that um, if you have a positive attitude and you're smiling and you're happy, I mean, I did a uh, Facebook Live with my daughter, Christina, and uh, we had a blast. I mean, we <laughs> we, we did uh, spend some time laughing uh, during our Facebook Live, right? It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're enjoying the process. I'm enjoying the process of being in... In, in studio, uh, I'm even enjoying the process of going through mental cell lymphoma and through the chemotherapy uh, sessions uh, because everything that I go through first passes through the filter of God's love. And so I have a very positive attitude, uh, not only about my present, but also about my future. However, that's a far different thing from what Word of Faith theology is teaching people. Word of Faith theology is teaching people uh, that faith is a force, that words are the containers of the force, and that through the force of faith, one creates their own reality. And this is an inviolate law. And therefore, if you accidentally say, you know, I fear that my uh, chemotherapy next week is going to be worse than my chemotherapy was 21 days ago, Well, I inadvertently use the word fear. Well, the word itself contains power. And that power, therefore, has an effect on me. It creates a reality that otherwise wouldn't be there. If I say, you know what, I was so tickled during the Facebook Live with Christina. Uh, In fact, I was tickled to death by some of the things she said. Now I've said the word death. Uh, again, faith is a fourth word. Words are the containers of the fourth, and through the force of faith, when you create your own reality. So you can inv- inadvertently create your own death and your own sicknesses. This is what is being taught in Word of Faith theology, and uh, therefore it is pernicious. It has a dark underbelly. I've spent uh, a lot of time on this subject, wrote about it in Christianity in Crisis. 21st Century, a book available to the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute, as well as a book titled Ostinification. Um, he's the biggest of the bunch right now, and that's why I coined the word. Be right back with a quote of the day and more answers. As Christians, we are called by Christ to be wise and build our house on the rock. Darwinian devotees, however, have built their ivory tower on sinking sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Journalist Tom Bethel uses his decades-long journey through the flimsy evidence of Darwinism to make a compelling case to topple Darwin's house of cards, arguably the greatest myth in the history of science. To receive your copy of Bethel's book, Darwin's House of Cards, as our thanks for your financial partnership, Simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with more answers from the Bible Answer Man.
The complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition Revised and Updated is a comprehensive collection of the most often asked as well as most difficult questions Hank Hanegraaff has received in nearly three decades of hosting the Bible Answer Man broadcast. This expanded edition contains new entries, leading readers to a better understanding of God and our relationship to Him in Jesus Christ. The complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition revised and updated is a comprehensive, handy, and attractive volume that you will return to again and again. Take your exploration of God's Word to new heights and receive the revised and updated Complete Bible Answer Book as our thank you for your gift by calling 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. In his book, Darwin's House of Cards, Tom Bethel writes, The science of Darwinism was poor all along and supported by very few facts. Although Darwinism has been promoted as science, says Bethel, its unstated role has been to prop up a philosophy of materialism and atheism along with it. As Christians, we are called by Christ to be wise and build our house on the rock. Darwinian devotees, however, have built their ivory tower on sinking sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. To receive your copy of Darwin's House of Cards as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. Has God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs of the Bible's Divine Inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Equip. Org. Veteran journalist Tom Bethel is inclined to say that there is actually no evidence for evolution. We're inclined to agree. The Weekly Standard says that as a journalist, Tom Bethel is fearless. As a storyteller and stylist, he is peerless. We're inclined to agree with that as well which is why we want to get his new book, Darwin's House of Cards, into your hands today. To receive your copy of Bethel's book, Darwin's House of Cards, as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit equip.org. We return now to the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Here's Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you very much, Randy. And the quote of the day comes from Colin Patterson. I finally got this right in the uh, first part of the broadcast. He's the senior paleontologist at the prestigious British Museum of Natural History, which, by the way, houses the world's largest fossil collection, over 60 million specimens. And uh, my daughter, Christina, she talked me into making this quote of the day. Now, by the way, there's a long version of this in Darwin's House of Cards, but there's also a short version. I'm going to give you the short version for the quote of the day. So here you have a doctrinaire evolutionist, Colin Patterson, saying this. For 20 years, I thought I was working on evolution, but there was not one thing I knew about it. So for the last few weeks, 
that I've tried putting a simple question to various people and groups of people. The question is, can you tell me anything you know about evolution, any one thing, any one thing that is true? I tried that question on the geology staff at the Field Museum of Natural History, and the only answer I got was silence. I tried it on the members of the Evolutionary Morphology Seminar at the University of Chicago, a very prestigious body of evolutionists, and all I got there was silence for a long time, and eventually one person said, yes, I do know one thing, it ought not to be taught in high school. During the past few years, you've experienced a shift from evolution as knowledge to evolution as faith. Evolution not only conveys no knowledge, but seems somehow to convey anti-knowledge. Now, what's interesting again about that is this is an evolutionist. He didn't change from being an evolutionist to an ID proponent. He's an evolutionist. He just says, I accept evolution, not because the biological facts fix all the facts. Uh, the, 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 the reality is they don't. In fact, they point in a different direction, but I believe it as a faith. So that's his faith. And this is a great example for all of us as Christians. We should never believe anything as blind faith. Rather, we ought to accept what we believe in as faith founded on a refutable fact. Let's go back to the phone lines. Dr. Ryan in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada, CHRB. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Hank. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Uh, Not too bad. I hope all your treatments are going well, and I'm just keeping my prayers, and I thank you for... um, just sharing the truth and love with people. Well, thank you. I'm sure that I am feeling great as a result of your prayers and the prayers of uh, thousands and thousands of other people. Thank you. Amen. Um, my question is, um, I phoned you before, but uh, I have some family, and I just I love them very much. They've helped me a lot, and I'm very grateful for it. But I'm just concerned because a lot of the, the people they listen to and um, buy books of and stuff are either related with Word of Faith or NAR. And some of the things they say, I'm like, oh, that's real dangerous. Like, that's not right at all, like speaking things into existence and, um, you know, all these things. And I try to reason and and be gentle and loving. But um, one time maybe I was not, I might have uh, not done it properly, still being sanctified, thank God. Um but uh, I just sort of mentioned a teacher, Jesse Duplantis. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or lack thereof. Um, but he he spoke about he went to heaven like a lot of people do, which they also believe. Um, and he, um, Jesus told him he knew Jesus was sad and he had to comfort Jesus and clear his schedule and all this nonsense. And, um, and I just thought, like, um, if you believe God's sovereign but you believe this is true from this guy and that he's a true teacher, it kind of contradicts. Like, I'm really concerned, I guess, what I'm asking about. Um, is G- Could Jesus, I'm concerned, be an idol to them, that it's a different Jesus than the Bible speaks of? Because if they think he needs to be comforted by a man who's yet a false teacher even and false prophet, um, I just, you know, I don't want to overstep my boundaries, but I just don't want to compromise the truth, and I, I love them, so... Yeah, well, I I think what you want to do is do whatever you do with gentleness and with respect, uh, because the goal is to reach and not repel. But yeah, I mean, I I think what they've done in essence, whether they know it or not, is they've, they've made God into some kind of a cosmic genie who is there. Uh, not as the end of our worship, but a means to our ends. And in biblical theology, God is the end. And uh, as I've said on many broadcasts, unfortunately what's happened is uh, we, have, uh, we, we have induced people, and, and these Word of Faith teachers do it all the time, to come to the Master's Table not uh, because they love the Master, but because of what is on the Master's table. A lot of the quotes that you just mentioned with respect to Jesse Duplantis, I, um, I chronicle in my book, uh, Christianity in Crisis. Thanks for your call. Back to the phone lines. Tony, St. Louis, Missouri, Sirius XM 131. Hi, Tony. Hey, Hank. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your ministry. You've been a huge blessing to me for the last uh, 
15 years that I've been listening to you on the radio, and you are for sure in my prayers. I pray for you every day. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to share you. that right up front. Thank you. Uh, sure. And just real quick, my question, I was recently, and I, I heard you just share a little bit recently on the whole issue of climate change and how it affects um, our world. And I was recently listening to a program on HBO. It was uh, Brian Gumble was doing a special, and they were talking about the coral reef in Australia, and they were interviewing this gentleman that has been a scuba di- diver for you know years. I mean, he's an elderly man, and he was basically saying that a lot of the, the destruction of this coral reef has to do with climate change. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts would be on that, because obviously I know God calls us to be good stewards of you know, here while we're here on Earth. And I just want to make sure I have a good idea and an understanding. Do you believe that that's a possibility that because of the ozone that it is truly affecting this coral reef in Australia, and that's why it's dying out? Well, look, here, here's the point. The point is we need to take into account all the factors that affect Earth's habitable temperature range. Uh, Earth's habitable temperature range is not something that we can take for granted. Uh, we, we have to think about it clearly, and, 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 and we have to realize that uh, the only answer cannot be what human beings are contributing uh, to the problem. Uh, and, and I think therein lies the conversation stopper. Um, oftentimes people do not want to look at all of the possible, uh, reasons for, for, uh, climate change. Uh, and, and some of these reasons are pretty esoteric. I mean, for example, too much axial tilt uh, would mean too much variation in the seasons. Well, there is actually actual tilt. Uh, The Earth is tilted 23.5 degrees perpendicular to the plane of its orbit, Uh, but not always. Uh, There is a change from time to time, so the tilt is only 22.1 degrees. Uh, Sometimes it goes all the way to 24.5 degrees, and that cycle takes 41,000 years. Well, you've got to take that factor into consideration. Also, you have to take into consideration the fact that Earth has undergone a kind of temperature oscillation cycle between 100,000 years of bitter cold and glacial advance, followed by 10,000 years of warmth and glacial melting. And uh, it's kind of interesting to me that we're at the end of a 10,000-year warm period called the Holocene period. And, and, and so this oscillation cycle, and, and, and we're now at the end of it, uh, means that we could be entering into a long period of cold. Now think about this. If you go back to my generation, I can still remember seeing on the cover of Time magazine the looming ice age. That was back in the mid-70s, I think, maybe 1974. But that was a cover of Time magazine. Um, now we are in a, in a different cycle. We're talking about global warming. So what do you have to do? I mean, I think in light of the HBO special that you saw, you have to learn to ask the right questions, ask the right questions in the right sequence. And I wrote a little booklet on that that is available through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. I've also... Uh, I also added an entry to the complete Bible answer book, collector's edition, revised and updated on this subject. So those are available through the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. Let's go back to the phone lines. Talk to Lee, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, K-A-R-I. Hi, Lee. Hello, Hank. Uh, Thanks for uh, your passion for the truth. I I really appreciate that. And my empathy and prayers to you in regards to your cancer that is going on right now. Thank you. Um, my question is in regards to Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, and what I'm trying to deal with with a friend of mine is uh, the question is, was David uh, totally unconditionally forgiven after his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband? Uh, because, of course, the uh, nation said to David that, uh, that uh, the Lord has taken away your sin, you're not going to die, but because you by doing this, you've made enemies the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you will die. What is your 
take on that. Yeah, you know, the prologue to the question actually is the answer to the question. I think that uh, uh, the articulation of that prologue is, is, is pretty elegant. Uh, and that's exactly how I would answer the question, just going back to what you said. Yes, it is true that David was forgiven. Uh, and, and the Lord says that, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You find that in, in Psalm 51. So David is contrite, and God forgives him of his sins. But the consequence to his sin follows like night follows day. And this is one of the reasons we cannot sin with impunity and say, well, God will forgive. There are consequences to our sins. And in David's case, the consequences were horrendous. Not only the death of his child, but the sword never left his, his, his family. So the consequences followed him uh, throughout his lifetime. Uh, that's why you have him pleading so earnestly, save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Well, you can hear from the music. We're out of time for this edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Benjamin Weicker, by the way, on the um, issue of uh, climate change. It's a great chapter in a book called In Defense of Nature. But we'll be back here tomorrow with more answers to your questions. Remember the number dial is always 888-ASK-HANK. Thanks for standing shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. What you do really makes a difference for not only time, but eternity as well. Thank you for joining us today. Our mission at the Christian Research Institute is to equip Christians to think and live Christianly. In appreciation for your gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, Hank Hanegraaff would like to send you a copy of Tom Bethel's book, Darwin's House of Cards, to show you why, like Bethel, he's inclined to say that there is actually no evidence for evolution. Just call 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-CRI. You can also write CRI at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28271. Or simply visit online at equip.org. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is funded solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because life and truth matter. A deeper understanding of the Bible's principles and truths will improve the spiritual, moral, and ethical problems facing our nation. Yet the obstacle isn't that the Bible doesn't speak to our greatest needs or answer our deepest questions. It's that the average person lacks the time and tools to extract the answers. That's why Hank Hanegraaff wrote the complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition, Revised and Updated. This expanded edition addresses over 210 of the top questions he's received as host of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Hank has taken the complex and made it simple and memorable. Receive the revised and updated complete Bible answer book as our thank you for your gift by calling 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org. That's equip.org. In his book, Darwin's House of Cards, Tom Bethel writes, The science of Darwinism was poor all along and supported by very few facts. Although Darwinism has been promoted as science, says Bethel, its unstated role has been to prop up a philosophy of materialism and atheism along with it. As Christians, we are called by Christ to be wise and build our house on the rock. Darwinian devotees, however, have built their ivory tower on sinking sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. To receive your copy of Darwin's House of Cards as our appreciation for your financial partnership, simply call 888-7000-CRI make a gift to support CRI's many outreaches, 
7000CRI or visit equip.org.